Last week I uh, began talking about the Psalms and I made a comparison between the Psalms and coffee. You see, when I was a young man, that might be too generous, when I was like 12 or 13, I uh, realized that I was having a hard time getting going in the morning and, and I figured the right way to solve this problem was to get caffeine. I, I didn't realize I should just go to bed earlier because that would have been wise and at 12 we're all morons. But uh, so I wanted to get caffeine in the morning and so I started drinking coffee. I didn't like coffee but I wanted caffeine so I learned to like the coffee and, and now I drink coffee all the time. I'm kind of bummed I don't have another cup in front of me right now. But uh, the way for, that I learned to love coffee was first realizing how much I needed caffeine. I'm addicted and I can stop any time, I promise. And uh, <laughs> in the same way, I, I talked about the Psalms. Uh, that the Psalms are like coffee. I don't particularly like the Psalms. I find them kind of repetitive and boring. But I need to be, continue to learn how to pray. I need to continue to, to get better at that. And, and just It's not the thing I am best at in life. And the best way to continue to learn how to pray is to read the Psalms. And so, though they are not my favorite book of the Bible, I'm going to learn to love them just like I learned to love coffee. It's just going to take me a while. And so, I, I know that um, this is probably not something... I mean, maybe you all are wonderful people and better than me, and you all just love the Psalms and just bask in them daily. And if you do, great. This really isn't for you. This is more for those of us who have found, have had some challenges reading the Psalms. And, uh, and so today I'm, I'm going to give you what, uh, what I think I need at least, and hopefully it will help you as well to, to read the Psalms. What I'm giving you today is what I have been hoping someone would do for me for literally a decade. I've been waiting for someone to hand me a, a, a put together guide. Here's how to read it. And I, I finally got tired of waiting for someone, so I guess I just did it myself. And um, so we're going to and for me to get my mind around something that, that's big and vast, I mean, 150 psalms, that's a lot. To get my mind around something that big, I, I know I, what I need is someone to give me some bullet points, a couple themes to look at. And so that's what I've given you. This, this is your, your guide to how, how to read, including examples. Uh, and I will tell you up front, I'm borrowing strongly from a fellow named Walter Brueggemann. And so what I'm giving you this day, I hope that you take it, you stick it in, in your Bible in, at the front of the Psalms, and then just use it as a bookmark as you read through the Psalms. This is, I think this will help. To, to, before we dive into it, just to state a few obvious things about the Psalms, there's a lot of them. 150 Psalms. That's kind of intimidating to start reading those. And, and it's everything from Psalm 13. I read you the whole thing. It took all of, what, three, four lines? And that, nice and short, to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. It, it's not a chapter. It's like three pages of single-spaced lines. It, it's like an endeavor to read Psalm 119. And the challenging part about the Psalms is they do not seem to be in any particular order. I've looked. I can't find one. There's not an order to it. There's a couple things that kind of make sense. Psalm 1 talks about the importance of reading God's Word. It's a good way to start out the book of the Bible. The last Psalm, Psalm 150, is talking about worship. You don't want to end with a buzzkill. So, I mean, there are some things that make sense. Psalm 50 is God saying, you done screwed up. And Psalm 51 is David saying, King David saying, Huh, you're right, I did. I mean, so there are some things that kind of connect, but in general, the Psalms are just kind of, it's like they threw darts at the wall to pick the order. So if we're, we're going to read those, we need something to hold in front of us to, to have a sense of how, what, what are the, what are the types of psalms we're looking at? And the best way to understand the psalms, the way that seems simplest yet useful to me, is um, to divide them into three different types. You can remember three different types, and you got them in front of you just in case you forget. And, and the three different types are orientation. When you're celebrating how life is orientated properly, life is good, God is good, family is good, job is good, everything's just just great, pop, properly orientated. Thank God, this is great. Those are those are that's one big old chunk of the Psalms, the Psalms of orientation. Then there's the Psalms 
of disorientation. Oh my God, my family is fighting. I've lost my job. I'm sick. I'm not quite sure if I'm going to make it. Where are you, God? Psalms of disorientation. Everything's confused. Those are the psalms where the gloves come off because that's the psalms where you get angry. Why is this happening, God? Then finally, the psalms of new orientation. God has worked. God has delivered. God has healed. And now that that has happened, things are different now. And so that... That's kind of the arc of the psalms. They're in various orders, but for the most part, every psalm is one of those three. Thank God, everything is as it should be. Orientation. Ah! Disorientation. Or, we got through it. New orientation. That's not quite how Walter Brueggemann put it in his book, but that's my, my interpretation. And so we're going to take this, and uh, if you'll get that out, and if you want to try to flip through and keep up in your, your Bible with the Psalms, uh, feel free to attempt to do so. If not, you can go back and do this, this later. But uh, we're going to go through, it, there are different pieces of those three types. There's different like subtypes, you might say. For example, with the, the Psalms of Orientation, there are the Psalms like Psalm 145 that are just a celebration of how wonderful this world is that God created. And because God has created an orderly world, the psalm itself is orderly. There is a type of psalm that's called an acrostic. You know when you see a word spelled out and, uh, and then each letter of the word is used in a phrase, and we tend to use that to decorate houses, it's very cutesy, and that's what they use in a lot of psalms. It's called acrostic, where every letter, every line of the psalm begins with the next letter of the alphabet. Except it's not the alphabet because that's English. It's the Elif Beit. Because it's Hebrew. Elif Beit, Gamal, Dalit. And, and so we completely lose that they're acrostics because we don't speak Hebrew. But Psalms like 145 are, are acrostics. And, they, and, just like they, and it's making the point that God has created the world that's as orderly from A to Z. And, and so the order of creation is reflected in the, how this psalm is put together. And so there are psalms like that. There are psalms of Torah. Like what I read you in Psalm 119, how shall a young person keep his way pure by attending to God's word? And so we, we look at that and uh, it is also organized in a sort of acrostic fashion. There are the wisdom psalms like Psalm 37, which it, it's like they just cut, cut and paste a chapter out of Proverbs and, and here's a, a psalm that's all about how to live. There's the songs of retribution. You get what is coming to you and that's how God meant it. You do something stupid, God help you. You do something good, well, that, that's, it'll work out well for you. There are, are psalms of well-being, joy when everything is going right and the church is chugging along and all of God's people can say amen together and yes! There, there are, these, are all the, these are the types of psalms of orientation and everything is just wonderful and great. And then we get to the psalms of disorientation when they're not so much. And, and to be clear about psalms of disorientation, the psalms of, of, of there's a problem, God, I'd like you to pay attention to it, we get uncomfortable with them because how many of us have this sense that you should never be mad at God? Or you can't be angry at God? Or there are certain things you shouldn't say to God? I mean, we sort of get that. It's kind of floating around. You read the psalms and... Uh, that's not the case. The Psalms are bold because people are angry and hacked off and, and they take that anger to God and they say, you know what God, you're going to have to do something with this anger because I ah, just can't handle it. And so these make us nervous, but they are the truth. There are times when, when life is off the rails. And so these, these psalms tend to use hyperbole and stretch language and, and the gloves come off and, and things tend to get ugly in these psalms because sometimes life is. And they tend to start with complaint and end with praise, but there's always that strong complaint at the beginning. And so there are psalms like Psalm 13 we read earlier. That's uh, about as simple and as standard a psalm as you get when it comes to complaint. God, could you pay attention to me? Where you been? Life is hard. There are psalms of, of communal, communal lament. Psalms like Psalm 74, when the temple has been destroyed. And the people are confessing that they've messed up and, and they need help. And God, could you get involved here? And, and I think it's hard for us to, 
to get our minds around what it's like for an entire people to confess that they messed up and they need God because, well, how often does an entire how hard is it to get one person to admit they're wrong nowadays? Recently we heard Chris Christie, mistakes were made with the bridge. No! Mistakes were not made. Your administration done screwed up. And this is the proper psalm for that administration right now. We done screwed up. Not, I mean, that's the type of thing that uh, He's just the most recent idiocy. We can go back and find many of them. These are the psalms of, I done screwed up. God help us. There are psalms set to specific uh, events. The Psalm 137 by the rivers of Babylon. And, and this is a psalm that is so venomous that it is, it is hard to read it. It's hard to read it in public because... It is just taking all your venom and anger and just throwing it at God and saying, you know what, this is, I'm, I'm angry and you're going to have to do something with this because I got nothing. There are psalms where everything is messed up. This is, if the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself, there are two psalms that are the antithesis. Psalm 88 has no love of God and Psalm 109 frankly wishes your neighbor would die. That, uh, yeah. That that's about the right response. And, and it's an amazing thing, because th this is when you're just so angry, and, and there is a psalm to pray and to read when you're so angry that you just want, that, as it says, the ba you want children's heads to be bashed against rocks. <laughs> I didn't plan that. <laughs> and I'm not thinking of that child in particular. <laughs> but there's this sense that when it is just that rough, you can take the, your gloves off and not, and not pull any punches when you're praying to God. And that might be the single best thing to do with that type of anger. Because if you try to hold it in, you're just going to get angry, do something stupid. And so to take that type of anger and just to offer it to God and say, you know what, you're going to have to do something with this. There are psalms where God tells us why uh, things are so messed up. Psalm 50 is, is a psalm in the voice of God saying, you know, this is why you're having such problems. And, and so you go through these psalms and uh, there's almost a sense that you can't get to being thankful to God again until you've gotten it all off your chest. Uh, you can't get from disorientation to a new orientation. You can't get from problems to solutions until you just take the time to get down before God and yell. And, and part of reading these is some, some, sometimes you read this and, and you're not angry. And maybe then the question is, but who, sh who is and who should be and can I pray it with and for them? So those are the psalms of disorientation. And the last chunk is the psalms of new orientation. This is the, the psalms of thanksgiving, the celebration of what has happened in the past, the thanksgiving that the community has been brought back together, the, the looking to the once and future king. Uh, these are, there are a whole bunch of those, Psalm 114 and 29 and 96, a whole bunch of those. And, and finally, there's sort of the, the psalms that celebrate the future and say... Psalm 23, right? The Lord will guide, excuse me, guide me by still waters, lead me through the valley of the shadow of death. That's all future tense, right? This is what God is going to do. This is celebrating where we're going now. Now, these three sort of chunks, psalms of orientation, disorientation, and new orientation, not every psalm is going to fit into this, and that's okay, but that at least gives you a way to start thinking through when you start reading a psalm. You can look at it and say, what do I have here? What, what do I have in front of me? And you can sort of start thinking, what, what, how do I understand this, this psalm? And so that's why I invite you to do with this. As I, as I said, put it in your Bible, put it in the book of the Psalms, and, and start reading through. And I think what would be wise is to first take this and just read through the examples. You have all the, every number here is the number of a Psalm. And so read through the examples so you can get, kind of get your mind around what each different type is like. Maybe you don't read all the examples, but read a couple of them. And then go back to the beginning or start at Psalm 100. It really doesn't matter where you begin because there is no order to the Psalms. Um, but just start reading the Psalms and, and, flip, and just jot it in with a pencil. You know, you read a Psalm and if you think that's a song of retribution, just jot the number down right there so that when you find the moment when you need to pray that, 
you can get out that sheet and it's, your Bible is there and you, you know you have the words to say. That, that's, this is actually my plan. I'm going to take this. I'm going to hole punch it, put it in my, my binder I use when I'm reading the Bible. And this is, this is my plan to start to, to drink the coffee, to, to read the Psalms. And so once you... And let me point, remind us again one more time, why are we doing this? We're, we're not doing this so we can memorize more dry poetry. I'm not a big poetry fan either. I'm probably breaking my English teacher's heart as I say that, but I'm not. Um, but the goal here is to be able to do, uh, to be like that Psalm 1. The very first Psalm says, those who are rooted in God's word are like trees rooted by the springs of, e by the waters of Eden, able to bear fruit in every season. As we read the Psalms, they are going to be able to form us and shape us so that when we open our mouths when life is at its best, we will have words of praise. When we are in the middle of the worst days of our lives, we will be able to open our mouths and have the, the psalm come to mind that helps us express this to God without pulling any punches and trusting that God will be involved. And then when God, when God does get us through, we will have the, the words to say because we've read the psalms and we know them and how they've shaped us, how we speak to God. The goal of doing this in the end is a deeper relationship to God, a deeper ability to, to speak to God, to hear God, to learn to see every day as a gift, and to trust God with those gifts that are kind of hard to unwrap. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to this, hopefully praying the, these psalms with you, so that in the process we as a people, we as a church, learn how to better speak and hear what God has to say. Amen.